Welcome back uh, to the Stratcom podcast. I am delighted that today we're joined by uh, Valery Kowalewski, who is uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska's uh, representative on foreign affairs and head of cabinet. And he also currently heads the representative office in Kiev. Uh, Mr. Kowalewski establishes foreign relations and develops engagements to realize democratic change in Belarus. And prior to joining uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska's team, uh, he worked in the World Bank Group in Washington, D.C. Sir, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, let me start perhaps with a somewhat uh, dramatic question, if I may. Uh, there are some revolutions that have succeeded, some that have not. Could you please uh, tell our listeners how should we think about uh, democratic change in Belarus? Well, I would say that <clears throat> democratic revolution in Belarus is still ongoing. Um, yes, uh, it is much more difficult for us uh, to visualize the protest, to uh, to show that people uh, still care and still resist. Um, uh, but we know for a fact uh, that many of such activities went underground uh, and for specific reason, because uh, the security implications are very serious uh, in Belarus right now. For people, it's uh, difficult not only to protest, but even to express their opinions. Uh, but we have seen a series of cases uh, when Belarus are protesting because of the internal political crisis, but also because of the anti-war sentiment uh, in Belarus. People are uh, 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 supporting Ukraine uh, and they're also against the presence of Russian military uh, on our territory. And the recent, uh, the recent uh, bombing of the Russian uh, reconnaissance plane uh, in Belarus, A-50, uh, it belongs exactly to this uh, story, uh, that Belarusians uh, um, support Ukrainians, but they also oppose the uh, the presence of Russian military on uh, on our land. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, bombing? Of course, uh, some say it's, uh, you know, more conspiracy. We don't really know what to believe. Can you shed any insight into what happened there? Well, this is a real thing. Uh, this is something that happened, and it was not the first time uh, that Belarusian partisans uh, had the sabotage operations uh, in Belarus. In the early days of the war uh, against Ukraine, uh, there were about 80 acts of sabotage on Russian, on Belarusian railways against Russian uh, uh, echelons going towards Ukraine. That was the attempt of Belarusian partisans to slow down the advancement of Russian troops, uh, which actually... Uh, uh, negatively affected the supply lines uh, for Russians and uh, in some way contributed to to what happened uh, uh, by Kiev that uh, essentially Russians were not able to uh, to advance and not able to capture Kiev. Uh, now, one year later, uh, there's a more serious and more complicated uh, affair when Belarusian partisans sent uh, s uh, several drones uh, to analyze the situation and then they sent them with uh, uh, with bombs uh, to damage the avionics, uh, to damage the, the most crucial part of the plane. Yes, it is operational as a plane, but as a reconnaissance plane, it is absolutely useless. Uh, and now what we know, it has been taken to, to Russia for repairs, uh, but according to some estimates, it can take years uh, to repair that. Um, uh, we've seen from the reaction of, uh, of the regime, of Lukashenko and Russians, that they're really pissed off about this, that something like this still could happen in Belarus. But going back to the previous question, uh, yes, Belarus revolution continues. Uh, yes, it, is, it has not been defeated. Uh, Belarusians inside the country and outside, uh, political leaders, uh, democratic forces, civil society, they're all focused on the idea uh, that uh, Belarus needs democratic change and we're working on this on a daily basis. Um, you mentioned these, uh, I would say, heroic acts by of sabotage by certain uh, activists. Um, to what extent is it just random small groups of, of activists? And to what extent is the Belarusian society as such uh, opposing uh, R Russia's war in Ukraine? Because, you know, um, we should be skeptical of, of course, about the credibility of polling in authoritarian states. But for instance, latest uh, data from the Levada Center suggests that the majority of Russians still do support the war. What is the situation uh, in Belarus? Uh, it's absolutely um, uh, opposite to what's what's going on in Russia. About 86% of Belarusians are opposing uh, sending Belarusian troops uh, to Ukraine. How do you know this? 
uh, these are, uh, is, if I'm not mistaken, these are uh, numbers from Chatham House, uh, and uh, for quite some time they have been uh, supported uh, from other sources as well. Uh, Belarusians are not eager to participate in this war. Uh, then they don't want Belarusian troops uh, to to go and be part of this war. And uh, the this sentiment uh, of the Belarusian society is shared by the Belarusian military. Uh, Belarus is a fairly compact country. Uh, it is monolithic. It doesn't have uh, such economic and social divides as Russia. Uh, and uh, people feel each other. Kind of, we don't have any significant ethnic uh, differences uh, in the country. Uh, so we uh, we can be certain that Belarusian military carry the same sentiment that they don't want to be part of this war, and uh, um, this is the reason why uh, uh, Belarusian troops have not been sent uh, to um, to Ukraine because uh, Lukashenko and even Putin would realize that uh, this could be a rather consequential uh, step uh, if uh, if they send the military and Belarus uh, erupts uh, in this new protest and becomes a source of trouble uh, for Lukashenko, for his power, but also for Putin, because uh, Putin could be on the way to lose his only ally in this war. Uh, that's why non-participation of Belarusian troops uh, in the war is a sure signal that Belarusian society is against this war as well. Unlike in Russia, kind of Russians feel comfortable about this. This is a sort of, it seems like the n natural state of affairs to be in war, to lose people, kind of to, to lose members of the family. Unfortunately, this is the case, and they're still supporting this war. Thank you for that. Let's perhaps uh, a bit further explore this difference between uh, Russia and Belarus. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people uh, in the Baltic states uh, sometimes tend to now kind of overlook perhaps these differences, you know, saying that with uh, tens of thousands of Russian troops on the territory of Belarus, now even potentially tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus, uh, to what extent do you think uh, we should uh, still view Belarus as a sovereign country or or is it a country under foreign occupation, would you say? Uh, this is a rather complicated question and thank you for putting it this way. Um, definitely that we all agree that Lukashenko has lost a lot of um, sovereignty and uh, not only he lost it, he yielded it to Russians uh, and uh, for, for the reason of... Uh, uh, staying in power. This is his compact. This is his agreement with Russians. Uh, I'm I'm giving you away sovereignty of Belarus, uh, and you are supporting me while I'm here in power. And that started even before 2020, but after the revolution uh, started, uh, Lukashenko lost legitimacy and became very dependent on uh, on Russia's support. Uh, so by now uh, he is heavily indebted uh, to Russians and uh, he has to uh, provide certain services uh, to Russians. We have seen that from the start of the war, uh, Lukashenko did not deny any single request uh, from, uh, uh, from Putin to support this war, uh, providing territory, providing airspace, providing infrastructure, ammunition, uh, um, uh, equipment for, for Russians. Um, so we see this corrosion of sovereignty right before our eyes, and this is very concerning to us, especially when they bring in uh, nuclear weapons. We know that uh, from the history, and I think that we all can relate to this experience, when Russian military presence becomes uh, this anchor of Russian uh, uh, control mm -hmm. uh, over these territories. Moreover, uh, what we have seen in Crimea uh, is that Russians use the military installations there uh, to essentially uh, uh, consolidate control, project their control, uh, project their power, and essentially, kind of ultimately, to annex uh, the territory uh, from Ukraine. Uh, having nuclear forces in Belarus uh, from Russia definitely anchors them down even deeper uh, into our soul. It would be very difficult to uh, to remove them from Belarus uh, since then. And we know also from our history that when Russians uh, are coming, Russian military are coming to uh, foreign territories, uh, they're very difficult to get rid of. Uh, they never leave voluntarily. The, there will be some circumstances of political, uh, social, or economic well, like Georgians or Moldovans, right? Right. Yeah, kind of. We, we've seen these stories uh, for centuries, uh, how Russians are acting. So we should be super concerned uh, about uh, Russian military presence in any country, but especially in Belarus, that is kind of weaker, and uh, uh, they they are using this weakness of uh, of Lukashenko to expand, to anchor down, 
uh, and uh, then to uh, um, to, ex to exert uh, further control over Belarus. At the same time, we all believe that Belarus uh, must remain a sovereign, independent state uh, that will be governed not by corrupt politicians like Lukashenko, who is compromised, who is under control of Russia, but should be governed by the will of people. And uh, uh, that was the, the very idea of uh, the revolution of 2020, mm -hmm. uh, that people should be back uh, in the position when they rule their own country, not uh, some individuals who are corrupt and compromised. Uh, so we we are working on on specifically this task uh, that uh, the power is back to in the hands of people. Uh, so as this is the Stratcom podcast, uh, we should also discuss uh, different uh, threats and issues uh, related to the information space. Uh, we are filming here in Latvia in the Baltics, and we are very familiar uh, with uh, uh, narratives promoted uh, by Russian disinformation. You know, we are failed states. Everyone is emigrating. We are also Nazis and fascists. We are corrupting our children with uh, homosexuality. Uh, tell me, what does Belarusian state propaganda tell about the Baltic states? Well, uh, this is something that you said, uh, but also there could be some elements to this that um, Baltic states are sort of eyeing Belarus uh, with the perspective of how to divide the pie how to take over some of the territories, especially... Uh, we would want to expand... Definitely you would want, kind of, definitely that you are interested in, uh, uh, in this, uh, in sharing or dividing the, uh, the country between Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, probably Ukraine. Uh, so these, these narratives are very uh, popular. Essentially, they repeat, um, in Belarus, they repeat, unfortunately, the narrative of the Russian propaganda. And uh, that was before uh, the beginning of the war, uh, but especially after the start of it. Uh, it is important for, for the propaganda uh, to depict uh, Baltic states, uh, to depict Poland uh, as uh, potential enemies uh, of Belarus, uh, of Belarusian people. Uh, uh, and this is this helps Lukashenko to consolidate uh, the power, kind of to, to show that there's a threat there. We are in this... Uh, fortress and we have to uh, we have to be mindful how do we defend ourselves and and I'm the one uh, with around whom we should consolidate so is it kind of mirroring uh, Russia's idea about uh, being encircled by enemies and uh, uh, you know justifying certain policies through this idea that everyone is out there uh, to attack us yeah this sounds like a classic idea but again, there's this contradiction. Uh, uh, in the fr on the one hand, uh, Baltic states are failed states. They're under control. People are living. Socioeconomic conditions are very poor. People are dying and starving of hunger and such. But at the same time, you are very aggressive. You are trying to overtake other territories. Uh, so there's this uh, kind of obvious inconsistency in, in the messaging why weak states would be able to, uh, to be more aggressive. Uh, but it doesn't concern uh, the uh, the propaganda. They're also kind of trying to uh, um, essentially incite hatred uh, towards uh, uh, our neighbors, uh, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland in particular. Uh, so this is this is not just to explain that it is every everything is bad out there, but also kind of to uh, to attune people to a different wavelength uh, in how they see how they perceive our neighbors. And when it comes to the information space in Belarus, how strong do you judge the regime's uh, control to be? Is it total? Is it uh, North Korea-esque? Or are there still some vulnerabilities, some spaces for uh, contrasting opinions or, or free speech? It is rather heavily controlled. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, rather limited opportunities to... Uh, uh, to deliver our message uh, into Belarus, uh, not because uh, uh, we're incapable of this, but because it is so heavily controlled. And uh, uh, there are a number of uh, websites that used to be independent media websites, fairly kind of absolutely normal, legal uh, to operate in Belarus, which uh, after 2020 uh, became illegal. Uh, they were designated as extremist and the access to them uh, has been completely prohibited. Same goes to um, Telegram channels, uh, for example, all these new social media uh, uh, channels to deliver information to people. They are either blocked or they're called extremists and uh, whoever is uh, 
whoever has this uh, uh, subscription, for example, in the phone and uh, uh, police finds uh, the subscription, a uh, per- person would have a trouble, a serious problem uh, with law. <clears throat> People would be sent to, to prisons uh, for five, six years just, just for having a like in Facebook or just for having a subscription to some so-called extremist channels. Um, at the same time, we uh, we find our ways uh, to to go through uh, to to get our message to Belarusian people. Uh, YouTube is a very popular one, uh, also because the regime is using it. Uh, also, they uh, they they like the platform. They don't have any alternative. Uh, they're using this, uh, for example, to post videos. Uh, they arrest a person, they beat him up, uh, and uh, they record a confessional, so to say, confessional video when people speak against themselves uh, uh, under duress, which is like you you can consider as evidence uh, uh, acquired uh, under torture. Uh, uh, but it doesn't concern uh, the regime. It doesn't concern the law enforcement because they are thinking about this as the instrument to sow fear uh, among but, Belarus. But so I wanted to ask from the kind of Stratcom perspective, is the, is the regime's logic that people would actually believe these videos or is it to send a message of, of intimidation? This is about intimidation, uh, definitely. It's about, about intimidation, kind of you should think twice uh, and never go there again. Uh, so the idea is that people would not even open their mouths, uh, that they would not even lift their eyes uh, to look around and see something that they're not supposed to see. Uh, but this is about the culture of fear. This is about uh, imposition of this atmosphere on people when they are sort of paralyzed with fear and cannot do anything. And um, would you say that uh, you mentioned the regime uh, is using uh, YouTube to spread its agenda? Would you say that the regime in general is skilled at using digital technologies to exert control? Because when these technologies were on the rise, uh, scholars not, and also people uh, thought this would be kind of the path to to freedom, to emancipation, that it would give the voice to everyone to to challenge uh, to challenge authority. Reality has, of course, uh, proven different. It's actually autocratic regimes that are using these tools to strengthen control. Uh, how, how is the, the Lukashenko regime managing this? Very much the same way as you just described. Uh, yes, it is a shield and the sword in the same way. Uh, yes, uh, it is possible still to use these uh, um, networks, these new technologies to spread the message, to mobilize people. Uh, but this is exactly why uh, Lukashenko and the regime are so concerned about them. So they want to defeat this or they want to overtake controls over this and uh, they have been become rather savvy uh, with this uh, uh, trying to prevent people from using uh, this kind of uh, uh, new technologies new forms of uh, communication or receiving information uh, but also overtaking the control over them and uh, using uh, to their own advantage uh, uh, so they have been quite skillful we also need to understand that while democratic movements like ours uh, is decentralized uh, it is very scattered people are doing what they want uh, not necessarily coordinating in any way and form uh, the regime is a rather disciplined machine uh, kind of this is uh, uh, this is the place of huge resources when they can buy people when they can buy resources when they can buy technologies uh, and when they uh, can, in a very coordinated manner, direct them to resolve this, this or that task. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, uh, rather well-built, uh, disciplined machine, uh, whereas uh, there, there is no space uh, for disobedience uh, and uh, fighting the people, which is kind of a broad decentralized mass of uh, initiatives or individuals uh, fighting them. So both uh, both concepts have their pros and cons. Uh, we can stronger sides, uh, but also to defeat uh, this machine, we have to we have to be considerate of their strengths as well. <clears throat> but if I can be kind of uh, blunt, uh, so what is the plan for uh, breaking through this uh, informational iron curtain? Is the plan to teach? Uh, uh, grandmothers in uh, Vitebsk uh, to use VPN so they can uh, listen to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's videos? Is it to have some sort of, uh, I don't know, cyber solutions to, to break through? Is it to have uh, independent media operating outside the borders of Belarus that somehow uh, push their content uh, forward? 
what is what is the plan? Uh, you're right in what you have already uh, listed. Uh, these are all important elements. Yes, we need to educate people how to bypass all these restrictions while also being uh, very careful, uh, cautious about uh, how they how they proceed with this because it can be detrimental to their freedom. Uh, we also need to think about uh, the the new type of content. Uh, people are tired uh, about the political messaging. Uh, they they might not perceive it uh, the way we want. Uh, it is, for example, very difficult to tell about our international work uh, just because it is very abstract for people. Kind of how do you tell the story that kind of catches people's attention and uh, uh, and when they perceive this information as sort of applicable to their own experience. Uh, so we need to think about the content that would be uh, very close to people. Uh, let's say talking about uh, what we do in the kitchen in the evening, like what what kind of food we prepare, but at the same time inserting the, the messages, the, the narratives, uh, the ideas and concepts uh, that uh, bring people back to the reality. And speaking about political prisoners, speaking about the repressions and speaking about the the future that we are losing uh, while Lukashenko is still in power. Uh, so we have to be nimble. Yes, we we have lost some ground uh, in this respect, but we um, we must direct more resources in this area. Uh, just for comparison, uh, we uh, when we say that Belarus uh, Belarusian democratic movement is receiving support uh, to fight uh, the regime of Lukashenko, uh, we we should be um, we should be recognizing that democratic, sovereign, independent Belarus is in the interest of all. And what democratic movement is doing is uh, is we're doing the work uh, for all the concerned democratic countries in the European Union and beyond. Um, and uh, this is why uh, the work that we're doing should be supported accordingly. But when we compare, for example, the support that regime receives from Russia uh, we, uh, uh, with the support that Belarusian democratic movement receives from the West, this is incomparable. Just uh, last year, uh, Lukashenko received from the Soros from the CIA, of uh, course. Uh, and who else? And who else would be interested in uh, supporting us? But uh, seriously, uh, Russia last year only provided about 15 billion euro of support to Lukashenko, and uh, now Belarusian democratic forces received about 80 million uh, altogether. <clears throat> so, uh, information space. Uh, is not virtual. Uh, it is not some something out there, kind of abstract and non-existent. It has material consequences when it is uh, yielded to Russians uh, to propaganda for complete control. This has material consequences, and, and of course, uh, in order for us uh, to be more effective there, we need more resources. We need more people. We need better ideas. Uh, so something uh, we already have, uh, like people and uh, and ideas, but uh, sometimes resources are not sufficient. Uh, in terms of a specific uh, capability, though, uh, under L Lukashenko's rule, despite um, you know economic stagnation and uh, people people uh, choosing to emigrate uh, if possible, Belarus nevertheless uh, built up a really uh, skilled and competitive IT sector, right? And uh, a number of these uh, companies and professionals chose to leave the country uh, following uh, following the revolution uh have they in any way contributed to helping you find new forms of resistance these so-called maybe cyber partisans can you tell about their work yeah it industry has been uh this guiding light uh, for belarusian economy for quite some time uh until 2020 and uh, it was not surprising to see them uh, being on the forefront of the protest uh, these young, educated, well-off people uh, who who wanted to live uh, differently, who did not want to put up with the old ways uh, of the regime. And so that was only natural to see them uh, being part of the movement. And yes, uh, and especially at the initial stage, they were integral to uh, to different types of support uh, for the movement, uh, helping people uh, out who who were in trouble. Uh, there were initiatives uh, to. Um, Sort of to to lure out uh, the law enforcement uh, officers if they leave the uh, if they leave the job if they leave the service then they would be supported. L lists of names, right, of those uh, responsible for committing uh, that to atrocities. Cyber partisans have been an essential part of the movement. They have um, done really terrific job uh, in acquiring necessary information and uh, 
or revealing uh, information about the criminals, uh, about the crimes uh, of those people in the regime. Uh, but at the same time, we understand that this is a highly mobile force. Uh, they they are leaving Belarus and they are leaving it for elsewhere. Uh, some of them go to neighboring countries uh, like Lithuania or Poland. They used to go to Ukraine, a lot of them. Uh, after the war started, of course, they had to relocate somewhere else. Uh, many went to Georgia, some went to Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and uh, you name it. Like everybody, every economy would be interested in having these people kind of on the ground. Uh, but it also poses uh, before us this concern that people are just moving away uh, from the movement and uh, not necessarily uh, staying uh, anchored in uh, the, the movement. So, But so in a paradoxical way, does the regime benefit from these more open-minded, more progressive, educated people leaving the country? Because uh, a similar process has taken place in Russia, right? Where more than a million people have now uh, uh, fled the country since, uh, in response to the invasion of Ukraine. Paradoxically, does this actually strengthen regime stability, people leaving? Uh, that's, that can be true. Uh, and this goes not only to IT sector, uh, but also to other professions, uh, uh, because people who are leaving, and there are about 500,000 people who've left Belarus since 2020, uh, out of 9.5 million uh, that uh, that used to live uh, in Belarus, uh, these are uh, well-educated, uh, entrepreneurial, um, uh, self-reliant people uh, who could again be excellent contribution to any economy. Now they are not uh, in Belarus, so this is a loss uh, to the economic life uh, of Belarus. But at the same time, for the regime, this is good news because all these troublemakers are now in Belarus. You don't have to put them in prisons. Uh, because it's also a burden or it's politically costly uh, to have thousands of political prisoners. Still, they have them. Uh, but <clears throat> when they leave the country, it's good news. I kind of let them go. So borders are not closed. The regime says uh, if, if if you want to leave, so, so be it. Uh, so now it is a tricky question because uh, Belarusians cannot just <clears throat> get up and leave uh, Belarus because uh, of the... Uh, Schengen zone uh, restrictions, we cannot just cross the border. Uh, it is dangerous to go to Russia. Uh, Ukraine is off limits, the border is closed uh, completely, so the only countries we can go to safely is Poland, Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, and uh, to get a visa to go to these countries is very complicated uh, because many embassies have been scaled down in terms of their personnel, in terms of their consular capacity. So this is a very complicated situation for many, many Belarusians who who would like to go, who would like to leave uh, this suffocating atmosphere and rather dangerous atmosphere. So people go to Georgia, people go to Turkey uh, to get visas there. It's a long, long road uh, where you in kind of uh, come across a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges. Uh, but when, when people want to have freedom, uh, when people want to have economic opportunities as well, uh, they they just have to embark on this road. Uh, you mentioned the role of embassies, and this is actually a sensitive issue that has divided the approach of certain EU and NATO uh, allies. Do you think uh, European countries uh, should still have uh, embassies in uh, Belarus? Should they accredit new ambassadors uh, to Belarus? Or is this actually giving a kind of legitimacy to this regime? From the very beginning, our point was and our call to um, Western governance was not to recognize Lukashenko uh, and sending ambassadors or receiving ambassadors from Lukashenko is one of the ways to recognize his legitimacy. Uh, that's why uh, many EU uh, nations uh, agreed with this point and they refused to send ambassadors, uh, gradually scaling down the level of diplomatic representation in Belarus to Chargé d'Affaires. But there's no uh, advantage to having eyes and ears on the ground, let's say, or somebody who is able to, I don't know, visit these political prisoners or offer some sort of um, assistance? Uh, the problem is that the uh, diplomatic corps in Belarus uh, is increasingly under control of, uh, of the regime. Uh, they limit their opportunities. Uh, uh, visiting political prisoners is impossible. Now, even going to the court trial uh, for political prisoners uh, is impossible. Uh, people would be just coming to uh, to the building of the court, but not not allowed to even enter. So, the impact from uh, from the presence uh, for this kind of activities is uh, is diminishing by the day. 
Uh, and since loans actually kind of even kind of we received the information that uh, the MFA would be calling ambassadors knowing that they want to go, let's say, to, to lay the flowers to uh, to the grave of, of somebody who was killed during the protest. It was like, you should not do this. And kind of don't go there because you will suffer the consequences. Uh, they would do this anyway, but there will be consequences too. Uh, so, uh, yes, having ears and eyes on the ground is important, uh, but it is increasingly difficult for them to do th even this basic function of collecting information, of monitoring, of observing and reporting back uh, to their capitals uh, since they're so much under control, also intimidated by the regime, kind of no less. Uh, and uh, this kind of creates difficult atmosphere in the diplomatic core when the, they want to do the job, but they can't. Uh, uh, when we speak about the consular services, uh, it does not take uh, diplomatic ties uh, to provide consular services, so this is not necessarily a, a precondition. Um, but Lukashenko is craving uh, for this attention. He's craving for this legitimacy, for this recognition, uh, and this is why he's so nervous. And I think this is this is the indicator that we're pushing in the right direction here. So I think in the in the final segment, um, it is important to place this in broader ge geopolitical terms, of course, uh, all eyes are currently on Ukraine uh, and their uh, literal uh, military resistance against uh, an aggressor state, an aggressor regime. Uh, tell me, in your view, in what ways are the fates of uh, Ukraine and Belarus tied and in what ways uh, are they not? Are you counting on Ukraine to defeat Russia and that creating some sort of cascade for Belarus? Or are you kind of uh, sitting tight and unobserving? To what extent are these processes linked? Uh, we definitely are in the same boat together, Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, Russia looks at us uh, in a very similar light, as sort of temporarily independent territories, uh, which are unprotected uh, by uh, bigger alliances, uh, like, for example, Baltic states are protected by NATO, and the EU uh, we are not. Uh, so we are, in the eyes of Russians, we are legitimate targets uh, for their aggression. Uh, they approach uh, Ukraine militarily, uh, but Belarus, they're approaching in sort of political terms through uh, influence, uh, um, through Lukashenko, who is compromised, who is corrupt, who is incompetent, and who is green, greedy for power. Um, but the idea is the same, uh, to destroy the statehood of Belarus, to wipe out uh, the national identity of both Belarusians and uh, Ukrainians. Uh, so uh, we're in this boat together, but at the same time, it is impossible to imagine that one of us survives. Uh, and uh, which means that we should stick stick together uh, at this point. And what we have seen so far uh, is that the concept of neutrality, which was enshrined in the constitution of Belarus since the beginning, actually doesn't work uh, in this conflict anymore. Uh, Lukashenko is uh, squarely on the side of, of Russia, helping supporting him to destroy Ukraine. Uh, but uh, Belarusians uh, abandoned this concept as well. Uh, they are on part of Ukraine. They support Ukrainians uh, any way they can. Uh, so neutrality is nowhere to be seen. People don't want to be neutral. Well, I, I don't want to uh, make it absolute, of course. Uh, many people would rather stay away from the conflict than not to have any part in this, uh, since they might not understand uh, the, um, uh, the nature and the origins uh, of the war. Uh, but, uh, of course, we see an opportunity for us all uh, to be liberated uh, from uh, from Lukashenko, who is being helped by Putin. As we learned previously, he received significant help from Russians, which helps him to uh, stand on his feet. <clears throat> but we cannot look at Ukrainians as uh, sort of, guys, you have to do the job and we'll wait until you finish uh, and you will open the new window of opportunity for us. Uh, we cannot afford this, uh, and this would be immoral for us uh, to uh, to stay and wait, uh, wait and see. Uh, we must do our task as well. This is our duty and responsibility to preserve independence of Belarus, and this is that was the the message of Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya on on February 24 uh, last year when the war started. Uh, that she undertakes this task of preserving independence uh, uh, of Belarus. 
now we have this uh, dual crisis on our hands, uh, this tyranny uh, as internal repression regime uh, plus threat to independence uh, because of Russian military presence on our territory. Uh, so any of these uh, problems would be more than big enough uh, to uh, to drive crazy anybody. Mm-hmm. Now we have a combination of two, uh, uh, which makes it uh, super complicated. But uh, what supports us uh, is the realization that our neighbors and our partners in the EU, US, in this transatlantic community, they also realize uh, that uh, this region will not be peaceful, will not be stable if uh, Belarus is under control of Lukashenko who is controlled by Putin. But this, of course, raises a very, uh, very profound kind of almost existential dilemma, right? Because uh, here in the Baltics, we we have a tradition of, um, let's say, peaceful resistance, peaceful revolution. This is an important part of our identity, of our heritage. And of course, that is one of the most inspiring aspects of um, the Belarusian revolution in 2020, right? That it was peaceful protest in the face of violent repression by the regime. But now, seeing the Ukrainians' resistance, do do you have any regrets about not uh, resisting militarily? Perhaps perhaps military resistance uh, should have been the path uh, to deal with uh, Lukashenko. Well, I think that the uh, the way the revolution unfolded uh, in 2020 was uh, it was the only way for us uh, to do this uh, on such a scale, on such a level, when it is peaceful. Uh, and um, uh, when we go look back at those events, uh, it's impossible to imagine that people would uh, would choose a different approach to protesting. Uh, that would scale down uh, the protests. People would stop uh, going out. They would stop protesting because. They did not believe uh, in the violence. Uh, they did not believe uh, in the way to uh, uh, sort of uh, take take up their arms and start fighting the regime. It was just not part of the thinking. Yes, uh, we understand by now we have lost a lot, a lot of people, a lot of uh, space, uh, uh, a lot of enthusiasm. There's a lot of fatigue now uh, also about those events. Uh, but... Uh, that was a very special logic uh, to these protests, uh, and uh, I'm I'm really heartened to to know about this uh, this tradition uh, of peaceful protest in Baltic states. But at the same time, we all remember that Baltic states were also prone to action when it was necessary to liberate uh, themselves from uh, from unwanted military presence that was Soviets uh, since 1940, and. Uh, um, in a similar manner, I can say, like, uh, if we speak about liberating Belarus, if we uh, s- uh, speak about preserving independence of Belarus, um, uh, that could be also the way to go. Uh, we cannot just rely on uh, uh, one toolbox uh, when we resolve different problems uh, of different uh, complexity and uh, challenges. Now we uh, we're approaching a point when Russians will be having a serious network of military bases on our territory, probably nuclear weapons. We cannot let this happen. Uh, of course, we will have to rely on the support of the international community uh, in the European Union uh, among our neighbors in the first place. Uh, but at the same time, um, kind of we cannot avoid uh, the situation uh when we have to uh to speak in serious about what do we do uh about getting rid of the unwanted military presence of russians on our territory but so what would you say uh you will do differently moving forward uh, than in 2020 how has your approach changed uh, have your principles changed in any way uh, I think uh, 2020 should uh, should stay in history. Uh, kind of, we cannot change uh, those events. We all appreciated what we've seen. Uh, and this has been a turning point in the national development of Belarusians, when we could see around uh, ourselves a nation uh, that is free, that appreciates each other, that wants to be uh, European, then uh, that wants to govern itself. Uh, I think that that played its role uh, in in this elevating the uh, the mass consciousness of people. Uh, kind of, we want to be different. We do not want to live the old ways any longer. Uh, but what we need to do now uh, is to to have uh, better organized structures. Uh, we need better resources. We need to have different thinking. We have to to have uh, 
much more unity among ourselves uh, to uh, the centralized protest back then uh, was beneficial to us when people were taking were in charge like every individual was a leader uh, that was great uh, but uh, now we have to to think about uh, more uh, better built up developed uh, leadership structures also when when people know uh, know the message when they know the, uh, the the objectives and and methods how to reach those uh, these objectives um we have to think about different capacities uh, for ourselves uh, in different spheres uh, on uh, stre- stratcom is is one of them uh, but also fighting disinformation uh, delivering people uh, correct objective uh, truthful information is very important um, there's uh, um, there's a number of Belarusians fighting in uh, Ukraine right now as volunteer fighters, uh, hundreds of them. Uh, and those people who are not afraid of uh, mortal risks, uh, mortal dangers, uh, and this is also um, a departure uh, from uh, from what we used to see, kind of uh, purely and strictly uh, peaceful, non-resist, non-violent, resistant uh, protests uh, in Belarus. Uh, and this and their presence itself is a serious uh, concern for for the regime. It might at some point become a deterrent as well. Kind of do not apply force to us because we are capable of uh, striking back. I think on this uh, forward-looking note, uh, we can conclude our conversation, uh, Mr. Kowalewski. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and Zhvye uh, Belarus. Zhvye Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emilia.